Watch yourself, Paddy. Elder Paddy. Some people romanticize Irish travelers, imagining a free people living at one with nature. You, you tie her back now, um, Gina, make sure that she's tied safe. But the reality is much darker. A recent AU report ranked them as the poorest and most discriminated against minority in Europe. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that's suffering as much as the travelling people. We're on that site there for a year, right? No showers, no washing facilities, no electric, and yes, we've peace. Appleby in the north of England. Each year, 10,000 travelers and gypsies gather for four days at the largest gypsy fair in Europe. She left her granddad. You did, you left me. You left your granny. You left your granny. Granny. For three centuries, these communities have been coming here from all over the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. This is where travelers celebrate their love of horses, a cornerstone of their culture, as well as haggle over their prices. What was that, 170? One of the sellers Hello. is Ned Stoke. Take a look, buddy. Yep. He and his family wouldn't miss this event for the world. <laughs> this is John's pony. One for my bigger son. This fella, Ned, he's 11. They come all the way from Ireland over here. So, yes, all together, four, seven, nine hours. And we're here. It's a way of life. We love them. I've been reared up with horses. So my children will be reared up with horses. Better than any iPhone. Uh, no inside all day. Outside, play with this, get fresh air. Can I look up my pony? Give us a few minutes, OK? We'll get the harnesses, though. Uh, get, get your bridle now and ride it around for a while, but keep away from that horse. Well, if you could kindly move him, it would be very good. <laughs> Do you not see this horse is going mad? Pull, him, pull her away. Pull her out there. Watch, watch. You took part of it. Watch him. I'll get a swivel in a second. I need a swivel, but she'll do for now. Ned has around 20 horses. He's brought four of them here and is planning to sell them all. Well, yes, he will. He'll be sold. Sell them, I would fucking sell them. Sell them! Nearly everything has a price. We'd sell horse, cart, jeep, this one, this one, caravan, everything except the kids. Kids is not for sale, but everything else, there's a price on <laughs> The best place for selling horses is Flash Lane. <laughs> On this straight stretch of road, the horses reach speeds of over 30 miles per hour. This is the sales yard. And this is where everybody comes down and we're showing their horses and trying to sell them. And some just here for show, completely show. Um, to show how good of a horse he is. If they want to race him or whatever. Or just Maybe just quiet for children. One of Ned's horses is galloping down the concrete road at top speed. He's hoping this will impress buyers. He's a fast horse, isn't he? Yes. She's losing grip on him, I don't know. Did he get water? 
You get water. He got lots of water this morning. The horse quickly catches someone's eye. 1800 quid. Food, Owen, give you gram. No good to me, honestly. I'm more than thankful to you. I actually. Haggling is a tradition among travellers. 1700 quid. Just go like that, job done, a pay in No good, my man. No good. I get more from my friend. 1600 quid. Tell him 1500 quid. I'll do what you said. Do you want to do it? Give me no, the underquid back. Honestly, I won't. I'm out. 1500 quid for us. Give me the underquid back. Negotiations continue for a good 10 minutes. 1400 quid on my own look. Give me the underquid back. Sell it, sell it. 1400 on my own look. Just tell me, I won't. I'm Listen, telling you now, I'm putting the down words down. into your mouth. Give me 15 Bang, down to you. Done. Putting the words into your mouth. The centuries-old tradition of selling horses is one of the legacies left over from the community's nomadic life. Ned's father taught him this trade, which has enabled him to earn a decent living. But for most of the 60,000 travelers here, Appleby is just a happy interlude. For the rest of the year, life is much more difficult. Recent laws have restricted their movement, and there aren't many places for them to stay. The Berry family has settled illegally in Wexford, in the south of Ireland, in this vacant car park. Hey, I'm going up for a turn of water. Walking up the tap for a turn of water. Helen, come here, won't you? The only water point on the site is 50 meters from Mary's caravan. She is a 65-year-old grandmother. Well, will you hold that? Okay. So you come up to this, you come up to this tap here about 50 times a day, according to how, and carry it back down to the caravans. This is how this is how it gets the water, gets the water. So. It's, it's a struggle in the winter time, you know, coming up and down for to for to get the water, and then you're you're afraid of the water, because um, this will have to this this does the cooking and the cleaning and the washing up. They had to repeatedly contact the local council to get this tap installed. They're still waiting for electricity. That's where we cook the food. And then we want, want to wash up after dinner. We, we have to use that water into this dish, wash up and for the water outside. We don't have any shores or anything for to take away the water. Like, these, these don't work. No water in the taps. That's where we have to go for the water. So there's, there's toilets in the caravan, but there's no electric to use them. And then four portable loos. Not very hygienic, you know. It's only you, you push a button and the, the disinfectant comes out of it, you know. And the kids have, there's no way up there to wash their hands after going to the toilet. So that's, that's, your, da that's your daily life, you know. Mary's daughter, Helen, is pregnant. She's going to move in next door. She and her husband are renovating their very first home. Oh, this is going to be a big room, Ellen. Yeah. And just making this as a big room. Put in the bed. The baby's cot and um, clothes and stuff in her. Why are you doing, are you doing the bedrooms next? Yeah. Very, very nice. Oh, that's lovely. A lovely job. If we had electric now, it would be lovely. It's the first time I have uh, such a big area, you know, to do things I want to do because in a small caravan, it's too awkward for anything. With clothes and stuff, you haven't got enough room. They're so expensive, you see, you can't, you can't buy them. So my a niece of mine made me, a, she got a house and she gave me that caravan. And that, then I gave Helen this, so she, Helen had more room for with the baby. <laughs> Mary receives the minimum pension of 1,000 euros per month. Her daughter barely receives more than that in benefits. Her
Her husband is unemployed. They have few possessions, except for five ponies, which they keep in the field next to them. This is Black Beauty. And that's her son. And that's her son. And his name is Luke. Over here, see where the water is. So then we feed the horses three times daily, four times daily, along with um, bread. I have to double tie it the way the pony won't get loose, the way they won't take it. Freedom here, instead of just getting getting locked up in a house all day, they said you're not allowed out. I'd rather be here than schooled with the horses. He was allowed to go to school, to, go to school tomorrow, yeah. so what do you want to do? Well, I want to stay here with the horses. Do any of the children play with you in school? No. None of them play with you. Yeah. But you have, you have her and her and your other... Seven yards. Well, we can put up a tent then, can't we? <laughs> Behind their laughter lies deep suffering. Their children struggle to integrate at school. They are often shunned by classmates as well as their teachers. When all the rest of the people is uh, doing big work, I just, they put me in the back of the classroom and give me baby work and then they make you draw fishes for five minutes, for ten hours. And Anna's 11, she's, she's going on 11 years old and she gets painting to do in school. And all the rest of the children learn how to read and write and, you know, and, they, and these are all just left. There's no, no there's nobody cares. That's always it's going on with generations and generations. Now my sons used to go to school. They give them a black bag, they clean clean the yard, clean the toilets, and clean the school. The very same as myself, as I was going to school. The very same treatment. Nothing don't change in decades. Today, the majority of travellers drop out of school by the age of 16. In Ireland, only 8% go on to complete their A levels. Without any education, it's difficult to find employment. Young travellers quickly find themselves trapped in a cycle of poverty. Like Peter and Shana, 21, who live in Limerick, in the west of Ireland. They've ended up here at the edge of this roundabout with their two daughters, Scarlett and Rihanna. Just blue for me? What's that uh, for you? The pink. They've been living here for five months. Yay! Scar, come on, baby, quick. There it is. In this minuscule caravan. Come on. The family is under constant threat of eviction and is waiting to be allocated social housing, but it can take up to three years. If I get this bed and if I keep pulling, I get this and I put this. Go ahead, feed the camera. Get this, I put this here and I put the other one here. So then it makes kind of a bed. It's not comfortable, really. But it's a bed. Nothing works. Like, like, nothing. Nothing. It doesn't work, you know. It's just for electricity. But there's nothing there, you know. With no electricity. Just decoration, just to make it a small little bit more homely. Like, when I look out the window, all I can see is a road that I can't really live in and out to play, you know, because it's very dangerous, obviously. It's around, but right there, and the cars goes around very fast. So I'd be afraid if they ever got knocked down, you know? So we don't have jobs. We, we never got no education. We didn't have time to get education. And it's, unfortunately, of the travelling people, it's a life that, that my little girls are going to be growing up into. It's not very good for anyone's mental health, really, is it? Like Peter, 83% of Irish travellers are unemployed. He's tired of living a life without prospects. He's suffered from several bouts of depression. I think, like, like depression is like a balloon, you know. When you blow up a balloon until it bursts, you don't know how much it's going to take, you know. There was suicidal thoughts, like, I wanted to drive my car off a bridge into the water. Mm, they were discriminating against travellers. Well, not they, one or two of them are. Um, I was just, I, I wanted to drive my car into a bridge, like, you know, into the water, but I said, no, I can't <laughs> think of my kids, like. Peter managed to get by this time around, 
but the suicide rate among this community has become alarmingly high. The EU reports that the suicide rate is seven times higher among travelers than the rest of the population. Most of those who take their own lives are young men. They are filling up the cemeteries, like this one in Limerick, where Mag Casey's entire family has been buried over the course of the past decade. This is my first cousin. He's dead eight months now. He died through suicide and he was only 27 years of age. He was a good boy. Lovely heart, lovely soul. I used to change his nappies. <laughs> yeah. That boy should not be dead. Nobody should be dead. <laughs> 29 members of my family died through suicide. Uh, a lot of kids and a lot of young men and women. It was as young as 11. Big tragedy for us as a family. We get to see each other more at the graveyards now than we do uh, at any other family occasion, unfortunately. Suicides lead to more suicides. This is the vicious cycle Mag Casey's family has fallen into. The first time I experienced suicide was with my sister-in-law committed suicide. So my, my brother, two years later, committed suicide because he couldn't live without his wife. And um, they left four small children behind after them. And then two years after that, my other brother committed suicide because he couldn't live without my other brother. Yeah, I think shock lived in my body for a long, long time. I don't think I ever got over the shock, if the truth is best be told. I never got over the fact of losing her. Why so many people are buried in the graveyard down through suicide is because of institutional racism, discrimination, prejudice, and Irish society dehumanising us Mag Casey has become a spokesperson for the traveller community. Her tragic family history has forced her to speak out. Other voices from the community are starting to be heard too. Today, in Dublin, hundreds of travellers are gathered outside Parliament. There is an urgent need for change, starting with breaking down stereotypes. They are accused of stealing, cheating and leeching off of other people. These cliches can be found anywhere in the world, but they are particularly deep-rooted here. The crowd is cheering for Eileen Flynn, the first traveller to be elected as a senator two years ago. Hey everybody. At the age of 32, she's committed herself wholeheartedly to her community. That I feel not only are you discriminated against, you have internalised oppression, externalised oppression. It's so tough to be yourself and be a member of the traveller community. You can't walk up the bleeding street and somebody has something to say to you because, just because you're a traveller. We're not treated as second-class citizens in this state. We're treated as rubbish. Woo! Mag Casey is, of course, present in the crowd. She's the one who organised the protest with her association that focuses on mental health issues among travellers. 
And uh, you're such an inspiration to our community and the issue of mental health raised it up and uh, because we're all so friends. So um, I just want to thank you again for all you're doing. Thank you, Susan. Mind yourself, how are you? How are you? I'm great, girl. I'm glad to have you. How's Patrice? Well done, girl. Well done, girl. Well done, girl. Well done, girl. Are you happy enough with the journey? Yeah, I mean, so what can you do? There is more here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're just building it up, you know? I think it needs to be brought to a European level now. Yeah. So all the good connections are actually out there. Yeah, exactly, which is the most important thing. I think unless we get into a real dialogue and that the political leaders sit down with us and take that seriously, uh, because we can't continue seeing the sorrow and the pain that they're living in on an everyday life. There are even ministers who have come today. Mac is going to speak to one of them, Malcolm Noonan, the Minister for Heritage. For years, the government has been trying to force travellers to settle down. But deprived of their way of life, they have become impoverished and marginalised. I just think from today, from, from history for the last 50 years, I mean, the assimilation policy, you know, it's not... It hasn't worked, no. No, it hasn't worked, no, it and hasn't, it has done an awful lot of damage. It's, yeah, and, it, and it's, 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 it's undermining traveller culture. Exactly. We really want to, so, to promote traveller culture in our schools right across society. Well, that's it. I think that's a step in the right so direction. Should, we can always do more, absolutely. Yeah. My gut feeling is that it has been inconsistent, and sometimes there's supports put in place, there are programs put in place, and then they're dropped or they don't continue. So I think there needs to be a consistent approach. It needs to be led by us, but it needs to happen with all agencies. Though the community seems to have succeeded in entering into a dialogue at last, their fight is far from over. The travelers still have years of struggle ahead of them. Johnny, 32, has decided to fight. He devotes all his energy to sport, starting at 7 a.m. I like going early in the morning because you feel better afterwards and obviously uh, it's good to um, have concentration and get all the bad stuff out of your head. So this is my fun, this is my this one makes me happy, so I have to keep doing it. Boxing is my escape, yeah. Box boxing is, is most traveling boys' escape. I feel if I, if I didn't box, I'd be a very angry person, and I know I'd fight a lot. I, I don't know how to use the word. It's, it's not aggressive, but I'm very... Um, it wouldn't take a lot to upset me. All my friends, they are 14, 15, and they try a beer and try a cigarette and sit, leads on, leads on, leads on. And now I look at them, I don't really have any I don't have them no more. Most of them are in jail. The ones who are not in jail are probably divorced, where, they've, where they're upset with what they, where they quitted in their life because they don't have anything to look up to. Some are in jail, some are dead. I have, I have a lot of friends who died. And there's more to life than just messing about, you know? To keep himself on the straight and narrow, Johnny devotes most of his time to boxing. He's moved to the Codswolds in England to train. He's been a professional boxer for four years now. The budding champion is feared by all his opponents. I beat everybody up, so no one wants to spar. I'll be in hospital today. I can do it going back and finishing the job tomorrow. <laughs> Time. And his coach, Roger, isn't just any old coach. He coached the first ever traveler winner in the 2014 World Championships. 
Don't get greedy. Control that back leg when you, when you set that hook. Don't let it swing after you. Just keep shifting your height. Keep stepping your feet. That's it. Don't close the distance. Keep that left hand in position. That's better. Uh, it's doing good. It's just working on a few things that we've been working on you know, on the pads and on the bag. Um, it's just about with a live, with a, when you're in with a live opponent, just, just keep working the same thing over and over again so it comes like second nature to you. So when you're in a fight, um, you don't think about it. Just finish up clean now. Finish clean on the jab. Ah, that's better. Boys, I'm going to have to stop. Are you awesome? Cut. Oh, fight in two weeks. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Sorry, what that do? The sharpest man, <laughs> next world champion. Cut. This sport has a long tradition in the community. Travellers have brought home many titles in the UK. The best thing about boxing, there was never any racism, because you all respect each other. People before, it was harder because they didn't see a way out. They didn't see, they thought, well, I'm never going to get this far from, from where I'm from. I'm a, I'm a traveller. How am I ever going to be this champion? Or how am I ever going to be a great footballer? How am I going to be a great boxer? I always get looked at different than everyone else, and it's the truth. But then you have people like Tyson Fury, who showed the way. So it shows that we were educated people. It's not that we can just fight, we can talk. It's very good. World champion Tyson Fury doesn't make a secret of his heritage. Nicknamed the Gypsy King, Fury is the hero of all travelers, including Johnny. When Johnny isn't in the ring, he lives in this housing estate. Like half of the UK's gypsies, he lives on a site that has been developed by local authorities. There are around 50 people living here, in houses or caravans. Come on, Jimmy. A 10 burpees, jumps at the end, big ones. Fast, fast, too slow, way too slow. Life is hard. All the residents admire Johnny. Oh. Especially the children, who he trains whenever he can. One, two, left hook. One, two, four shots and hook. Six shots and hook, fast. Why do you want to box? To be a champion. You want to be a champion? You want to be like Tyson Fury and Andy Lee? Uh, it's just good, isn't it? Best sport in the world. Best sport in the world, hard training, keeps you fit. You get away from the cigarettes and the drink. Yeah. And be, to be a champion, I suppose. Yeah, I do. Johnny works them hard because he knows that men grow up with a lot of pressure on their shoulders in this community. It brings them respect, discipline, morals. It's a lot, a lot of weight on his shoulders from a young age, from being from being their age, like all these kids here now, he's 11, he's 12, they've all already been saving money from being eight or nine years old to earn money for a car. And then when they get 16, a lot of these will probably be married at 16, then they have to save up to buy a home. So it's hard for us to earn money. Straight away, if we, if we get a job, say, on a Friday, and someone realises we're travellers and we go back down on Monday to do the job, they won't let us do it no more. And, and they'll it's not as if they hide it, they'll blatantly tell you it's because you're a gypsy. We don't trust you, so it's, it's, it's harder for a traveller, man. Johnny's dream is to become a champion one day. But, above all, he wants these young people to have the same opportunities as other British people. <laughs> but he also wants them to keep the same carefree spirit and sense of pride they share when they are gathered together at Appleby. One of the traditions here is to take a new horse down to the water to wash it. Business has been good today for Ned. He sold his four horses and bought a new one. 
Ned Jr. is not about to break tradition. He's heading straight down to the river. Ned, don't go in there too far. Ah, he's used to them. He's used to horses, yes. He's with them since he's a baby. He's no problem handling them. That's his new horse now. He has to learn anyway. In a couple of years' time, I will definitely be coming here with my own family, and I'll be coming here every year. I won't change anything in a traveller's life. I'm happy the way I am, and I shouldn't have to change to suit everyone else. The pressure that's been put on for to change people is making our way of life disappear. Pressure from other people that doesn't, can't understand what's going on, can't appreciate what's going on. But we're not trying to change them. It's hard for Ned and his community to imagine their culture disappearing and not passing it on to their children. It's also tough to face the risk of further young people taking their own lives. Nobody here wants to see another generation sacrificed. <laughs> 